Welcome back to this live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. With me, I still have Professor Bola Kintenwa, Director General, Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Yemi Adamalekun, Executive Director in Office in Off, and Professor David Awurawa, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. Well, today we have looked at two issues. First, we had the uh, Director of Media, Special Operations of the uh, All Progressive uh, Congress uh, Presidential Campaign Council, uh, Chief Femi Fanikayade, who basically, you know, talked about his candidate, his principal, Ashwajibola Metinubu, from Chatham House uh, presentation to relationship with the electorate, to his agenda, to his record, and a lot of other controversies. Uh, you know, around all of that. And then we had our Arise Post correspondent, Aaron Akirejola, uh, giving us updates on the ongoing nail-biting, you know, a record-breaking uh, World Cup tournament taking place in uh, Qatar. Well, let me start with you, Professor Akinterwa. Your take on those two subjects. First, I think that... Um any house that does not reckon with its foundation must be prepared all right, for the worst scenario. I want to think that Bola Ahmed Tenumbu's uh, perception, understanding of what a debate is all about, of what a lecture is all about, I think, uh, has um, some opic um, factors. For instance, the foundation I'm talking about, if you want to look at um, Tinobu's refusal to take part in a debate back home here, that part particular perception is what is responsible for his outing in Chatham House before coming to Fanikaode. I want to believe that it was a very serious and um, a strategic miscalculation not to have reckoned with the Arise TV and uh, the Center for Democracy um, initiated, you know, uh, presidential debate. One, you know, in research, that's what we normally refer to as methodology. You, you now have some frameworks carved out from that methodology. Methodology is simply a method of analysis. It applies to electoral votes here. According to Ruben Abati and Charles uh, Anyogolu, uh, there is a methodological framework that was proposed for this presidential debate. One aspect of it that is relevant here is that they say, look, all candidates Please, speak to the issues. You are not to turn it into an argumentative debate. Follow the tradition of the United Nations, whereby you come, say what you have to say, and then let the listeners understand it the way you have presented it. But no counter arguments. Now, the issue is that... Um, Bola Abe Tinumbu did not look at the beauty of that particular methodological framework. Now, he went to the UK, he went to Chatham House, and I think that uh, Abe Tinumbu also misrepresented, misunderstood what Chatham House is all about. I was listening to Fanny Kaudi, he's telling us it's not, it's not, um, 
a university is not a lecturing something. Please, Chatham House is an institute meant to inquire, to find out about your personality as not simply character, your personality, and then use that one to prepare for policy. That's the beauty. Now, if um, Ahmed Tinubu will now have to delegate, please, the problem, my problem is not that he delegated responsibility in answering. The issue is that when you are delegating in, in international practice, you provide the topo introduction. You, you, then you can now ask your men to complete that one. You must give an idea that, look, you are very conversant. There's nothing to suggest that uh, he doesn't know it, but he gave the impression that actually he didn't know it. That is the message he had given. And I'm saying that here, please, for God's sake, here, Chatham House, as it is, is supposed... Okay, let me conclude by simply saying that the moderator insulted him very decently. How? When, for instance, uh, Tinubu was asked questions, and um, he was giving another intro about uh, his own philosophies, what he believes in, and not answering the questions. The problem is that, in this case, the moderator said, help him. He was pointing finger the way you will say, uh, and this day, life begins now. The moderator, you can see it, pointing to someone there in the audience to, to help. He used the word help. Diplomatically, please, uh, in diplomatic statements, you, you, you can insult, you know, in such a way that the, the insulted guy will be very happy about that one. So the help was an insult? It was an insult, please, for God's sake. Okay, you at this point, let me bring in Professor Aurawa to the uh, conversation. Well, um, I would uh, touch on the two issues very quickly, uh, focusing first on... Uh, the Chatham House uh, you know, engagement by Ashwa Jibola Ahmed Tinubu. Uh, four issues I want to touch on quickly on this um, Chatham House thing. The first thing has to do with uh, the whole thing about Chatham House. Chatham House is the Royal Institute of International Affairs, United, you know, based in London. It's the equivalent of our Nigerian Institute of International Affairs here in Lagos. I do not know of any presidential candidate who has uh, indicated interest in going to NIA to go and lay out his agenda for Nigeria mm -hmm. in 2023. Mm -hmm. And there is this frenzy about going to London <laughs> to go and lay out the agenda for Nigeria in 2023 at Chatham House. I find it extremely difficult to understand why this. It's even, it now looks as if a Chatham House, uh, they need endorsement from Chatham House because very soon now Obi will be there. And I'm sure somewhere along the line. Oh, we have been invited. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Basically. That is the point I'm making. So the agenda they are laying out, is it for the British, uh, 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 UK okay. citizens or for Nigerians? How does it affect the person in Ozoro, the person in Kaura Namoda, the person in uh, uh, Talata Mafara to go to London to go and lay out the agenda for Nigeria in 2023? So that is the first point. This friends here about Chatham House. I think I want our abolition to take a step back. They should come home to discuss the agenda for Nigeria in Nigeria and not rushing to Chatham House to go and discuss Nigeria agenda. And look at the cost. I saw the large number of people that went to with Ashwaju to you know, Chatham House. So that is one. The second has to do with the issues. As far as the issues are concerned, Ashwaju actually addressed the issues. Security, economy, um, uh, uh, uniting the country, it touched on them. Where there was, you know, where, where, where we can say where it didn't do well enough has to do with the details. The question of how is not sufficiently answered. I would secure Nigeria. How? <laughs> the details are not provided. I would, uh, you know, make the economy work the way I did it in Lagos. People say Lagos, Nigeria is not Lagos. How do you hope to do it for Nigeria? Those details are missing. So that is it as far as that is concerned. The third has to do with uh, how those things were addressed. 
There has been a whole lot of writing here and there about how Shivaju, you know, gave questions to people to answer and all that. Well, um, he, he could have done better by answering the questions himself. When you compare the way he performed in Chatham House with some of the engagements in Nigeria before he left, he actually did better in Chatham House. So he could easily have addressed those questions he was asking others to answer on his behalf. Many have commented on that, and I think that it was not really good for him to have said, oh, you answer for me. Questions he could easily have answered. There were even some he could have answered that rhetorically, rhetorically he was trying to also push back to those who were asking the questions. So as far as the issues, he actually addressed them, except that the house were not properly addressed. And then finally, people say a whole lot of things in Chatham House or any other, all, all other you know, uh, places they go, to and they go and speak. The issue is how well would they keep to those things they say? We recall that in 2015, President Muhammadu Buhari, a candidate, they also went to Chatham House. He talked about reviving the economy, and he was very specific. He said a lot of money will come from fighting corruption. We save money from there. And money's recovery will be used to revamp the economy. Now, almost eight years down the line, how has the government fared in the fight, in, in the fight against corruption? Not much. Where are the proceeds of the few, the ones they were able to, you know, tackle? We know the issue of Magu and up to now, a whole lot of, you know, money is not being accounted for. So the trust of believing what this politician says is another thing. There is a trust deficit and many politicians say things they are not able to. So Nigerians will look beyond what these people say to what is their pay degree in fulfilling the promises they make. And then we can move away from there. Then let me say a few things about the World Cup. We congratulate Morocco. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I mean, the first time an African team is making the semi-final. So we are enthused, we are happy that Morocco, at least Morocco is geographically in Africa. Mm -hmm. Even though we have had the talk about, oh, it's for Arab, but it, geographically they are in Africa. So we are happy with Morocco, and we hope that Morocco will be able to even go further. There have been this. You are happy with Morocco. Yes. Don't say we. Uh, well, if there are a few people also happy along with me. Yeah, so, <laughs> anyway, well, what is your objection? No, you see, is Morocco, Morocco not in Africa? Geopolitically, yes. Morocco is located on the African continent. Morocco has never behaved, you know, like um, like a typical African country, even though it's in the Maghrebin. Um, you know, region. Morocco was to be used by by Europe, by America, as an instrument to infiltrate, to join um, the ECOWAS. Morocco tried. And um, in this case, Africa, based on Article 1, D, and E of the 1991 Abuja Treaty, establishing, you know, um, you know, um, African, you know, um, African economic community. Okay, divided Africa into five regions. Morocco belongs to the Maghreb, you know, northern region, and North Africa. And in this case, Morocco's relationship with Algeria, uh, Algeria, was to the extent that uh, they bastardized their own region completely. Well, now well. they wanted to join. Besides that. Morocco, don't forget that Morocco opted out of um, OAU before. Well, prof, before they came prof, back. No, so it's a, not. Just it a, a quick caveat there. Yeah. We're discussing Morocco today in the context of the World Cup. Yes. Yes. And Morocco, and Morocco yes. is using Africa's slot. And no, the whole of Africa is jubilating. But they are saying it's an Arab win. win. But they are saying it's an Arab win. Yes. That's what he's responding to. It is uh, for Africa, no. for Arab world, no. for everybody. No. <laughs> no. Well. No. No. <laughs> even when, even when um, the, the Israelis, the Americans were fighting with the Amin during the ATB um, attack all along, Morocco is the stepping, it's always the mid country, being used against Africans' interests. I am arguing here that, look, for me, I am praying that Morocco should not win. Because ah. in this, yes, you see, ah. 
The issue is that's a bit heavy. That's heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy. And Morocco should win the World Cup. Hey, yes. And it will be for Africa. No, no. But as even they even said it's going to be for Arab world. But it's the African slots they have now. Well, well, well. Let me tell you. Let me conclude my analysis. This is your view. I repeat that I I congratulate Morocco. I want to take those comments that were made regarding whether the victory is for the Arab world as the opinion of that young man that spoke at the mm. press conference and not the opinion of the Moroccan team or Morocco or the Moroccan the football said the same association. Thing. Uh, well, the coach said the same thing. So um, we congratulate Morocco. Even if uh, they are same for the, they are also very they are in Africa geographically and they are the closest to us of all those left in the World Cup. So we congratulate Morocco. We hope that Morocco will go further. Uh, Morocco's uh, exploits will also likely, you know, uh, uh, influence FIFA to even give more slots to Africa. This is how these yes. things go. Yes. So even if Morocco is dilly dallying, the impact on Africa will be extensive. We can really Morocco. For Portugal that lost, it's not that bad. Because Morocco's victory, this is the first time Africa, an African team is going to get to the semi-final. Uh, Portugal still has a chance moving forward to be able to come back and uh, prove their worth. There are many uh, players who will retire from this World Cup. It's not only Ronaldo. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We already had uh, mm -hmm. Suarez who was crying the other day, mm -hmm. and several others who are also crying. That's how it is. Some people will win, some people will lose, some people will cry. Even Messi. Win. This is yes. his last World Cup. This is his last World Cup. Lewandowski. If, yes. If they cool. lose, if <laughs> Messi's team loses on Tuesday, mm -hmm. he too will, will go home and then retire. That is how it is, and that is how life is. So we congratulate those in Morocco and those who have lost. Well, there is also always another time for them to come and try again. But Morocco's victory, I think, is a We should be victory. fighting anybody who is against Africa in all dimensions, <laughs> including in the uh, so Please give me much. Let's have your take <laughs> on the two topics. Okay, I'll ask. I'll, 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 <laughs> Bros, uh, anti Morocco well, stance is a bit there. Uh, I've contributed my piece to to the Morocco conversation. And I, and I like the, the parallel you draw when you say that you don't see them struggling to come to NIA, but they're eager to go to Chatham House. And I think it's a, it's a precedent that President Buhari set. Because throughout his seven years, there's been that ongoing com converse or comment that he talks to Nigerians when he's abroad. So that stage seems to do something, and we've continued it. Because I don't remember President Jonathan going to Chatham House. Exactly. So Buhari started it, and it's kind of then continued. But I think it's also, I would say, an indictment on NIA. Because I've also not seen NIA position itself as it. exactly as a place to invite them to come and have this conversation. There's nothing stopping them from doing it. And if they invited them and they decline, then you can have a different conversation around them declining to speak to Nigerians, but choosing to go to go abroad. But they've also chosen to speak to Nigerians in other formats. I mean, there was a Arise Town Hall last week where the three others who were in the country chose to come and, and address certain issues. Channels Television is, is doing their own series as well. NTA with Kadari Ahmed, Daria Media, also hosted a series. But the town halls and those conversations are fine. What I would love to see is a debate. And I think Nigerians really, we need to, yes, this is for anybody who's up in arms, debates don'ts, debates don'ts. I do agree that we're not there yet where debates can swing the needle in any extreme way. But it is a democracy, and debates are part of that. Sitting on a chair in a town hall, swiveling your chair and saying, well, this is what I will do to help education. No, get up. Be able to talk. And the idea with the debate, which is what I love about it, it, it allows your idea to be challenged. And so you have your other co-candidates, and because that's the format. You were just speaking about format. The format of a debate allows that to be challenged. And I hope the Nigerian Elections Debate Group is able to pull that off. And before people also go that debates are elitist, we've progressed from maybe 2019, the organization that I lead, Enough is Enough, we had a multi-language and a multi-channel debate. So the debate was in English, Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, Pidgin. It was on TV, it was on radio, it was on the internet. So that in every way, a lot of Nigerians could access it because access is also an issue and it's also a very important one. So we hope they do that. To your point, Professor Awara, about details missing on the how, I think that not only is that critical, but it also speaks a lot to, again, the power of debates. Because it's in a debate that that gets drilled in a, a little bit more. But the candidates also feel, for the most part, that people really don't care. Because if you thought people cared about the how, you would give the how. But if we're at a point where people are saying, I'm voting for him because of his ethnicity, because of his religion, 
because it is our turn or not your turn, then the details are neither here nor there. And so for candidates to have to deliver on talking about the details, there must be a demand. So from platforms like The Morning Show to all other platforms across the different TV stations, that must be there. And so there must be a lot more rigor in telling, putting back to them what they said or their promises and forcing them to actually give a bit more in terms of details beyond the pages of a manifesto. We've seen that people can deny manifestos. So it's better to have it on record that they say it themselves, that this is what, this is what we're going to do. And then lastly, your point about um, Tinubu at Chatham House, when you said questions he easily could have answered. I think the question is, if, or the point to be made is, if the, he could have easily answered those questions, why did he choose not to? And I think for me, that's more the issue, really, than you the see, fact that Abati he can... and Anyogolu, I refer to that one. That mm -hmm. methodology. Please, we need to understand this in context. Abati and Anyogolu said, look, you candidates, talk to the Nigerian people. But you other candidates listening, please, no counter arguments all along. So the freedom to speak freely, mm -hmm. That is what we call Chatham's house rule. Okay? You come, you tell the people, okay, there are lectures that you come, you give, you don't ask any question. All right? You finish the club and you go. <laughs> now, in this case, the Abati Anagolu framework is that, okay, please educate us on your agenda. And that's why I think that it was a strategic miscalculation for. Uh, uh, and I met Tinubu, not to have taken advantage of that. Nobody no, will no, criticize. No, I'm no. coming. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm coming. I know. I'm coming. You see, in this particular case, that particular platform, that methodology, if they have accepted that one to do that, nobody will be shy, afraid, all along, running away, that you might be frightened with some questions. And Abati can ask you questions that can embarrass you. Well, All right. but the, because, I think the, prof, the point is, is well, ability well, to I, communicate. I think we need to move on to yeah. manage time. But he said, a rice news framework, <laughs> not a batty. No, it's a rice news. Whenever it's 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 me, it's what I listened to that I saw. The methodology, what, what I had, yes. you know, it, uh, it's good, fine. You know, it was uh, defined uh, it's, by a team, it's good, it's not two persons. Anyway, you conclude then. Uh, okay, no, but yes, the, the point I was simply trying to make and, and uh, about the point is that if the questions can easily have been answered, and to your point about the methodology that doesn't open for feedback, then we should ask the question, why wasn't he comfortable enough to answer the questions, including questions about his own personal health? And for me, therein lies the challenge that we shouldn't shy away from. Okay, on that note, let's move on. Let's take another subject of interest. Reactions are trailing last week's decision by Bayes University in Abuja to stop 187 students on the presidential amnesty program from sitting for examinations following their inability to pay tuition. This follows the federal government's move to suspend plans to terminate the presidential amnesty program for former Niger Delta militants. Reports say the interim administrator of the presidential amnesty program Major General Barry Ndiomo retired and intervened in the disruption of the examination of the students under the presidential amnesty program. And the students have since, have since returned to school. General Barry Ndiomo retired and earlier confirmed the government's new position to resign its decision to discontinue the presidential amnesty program and express gratitude to the authorities for heeding his advice. Diomu said that critical stakeholders across the region were strongly opposed to the winding down of the amnesty program. The government's decision comes in the wake of a discovery by external and internal auditors of an extensive, massive payroll fraud in the presidential amnesty program. Well, typical Nigerian story. This was introduced in uh, 2009 by the Yaradua administration. Apart from granting amnesty, uh, to militants in the Niger Delta, our government also introduced a scholarship scheme uh, under which many were sent to schools locally and overseas. There have been issues about that. 
about school fees not being paid, about some of the uh, beneficiaries staying much longer on the program, having been abandoned, and then, of course, the controversy about whether or not there shouldn't be a sunset clause with regard to the presidential amnesty program. But we're told government says the program can continue, but many of the students have not had their school fees uh, paid. Uh, Professor Aurao, let me start with you on this one. <laughs> well, um, it happens to be one government agency I'm well familiar with. Uh, one of my very good friends headed the place, and uh, I used to advise him as to how to go about it. used to be one of those consultants. <laughs> no, 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 I wasn't a consultant. Ah, okay. I wasn't a consultant. Just to be sure. Yes, I wasn't a consultant at all. I, I would I just as a friend for him to do. I used to tell him I wanted you to do well on the job and have peace, and have peace after the job, because I knew a few things, uh, you know, that uh, um, the President of the program has been a good program. It helped to, you know, uh, douse tension in the Niger Delta. Uh, before the President of introduced it, uh, because of the militancy there and violence, the Niger Oil Sports came down to 800,000 barrels per day. But shortly after the program was introduced, the thing went up to 1.5, 2 million, 2.1, 2.3, 2.4 million. So it was a program that brought stability and peace to the Niger Delta. But it doesn't seem that the thing has been administered, you know, uh, to fulfill the objectives for which it was established. That's where the problem arises from. Um, there are people on the payroll, you know, get their stipends every month. And there are people that the government also has been training over the years. Is this second group that we have been more interested in? Instead of just giving them fish, teach them how to fish. And a whole lot have gone to school and uh, acquired degrees from there. It was supposed to have ended by now, but uh, the people there don't want it to end because they have benefited from it. And so it is good that the government is extending it. But just like uh, the uh, General Jumu has said, um, thanking the authorities for extending it, uh, he too will need to do the needful by ensuring that uh, payroll uh, uh, crisis where individuals who have not gone to school are listed and then the money is collected and all that. Uh, it's one of the things I warned my friend against, but it seems that a couple of those things even also happened under him because when uh, the probe was ordered, uh, the, the report indicated that. So it's been an ongoing thing in the amnesty program. So there is there's need for reform. And there is need for close monitoring of those who held the place. And there is need for those who held the place to be responsible, such that the purpose of which was established will be fulfilled. Uh, people are trained, they acquire skills, they are able to help themselves, and it contributes to the overall development of the country and ensures stability in the Niger Delta. Well, Yemi Adam presidential amnesty program. I'll speak to you generally, and again, in the light of. Uh our current issue with kidnappers and bandits, and the call that there also be an amnesty program for them slash Boko Haram. And I think the earlier point you made about the need for, uh, what did you call it, something clause? Yes, yeah, sunset. Sunset, thank you, a sunset clause. It can't be a program in perpetuity, because if you have a program in perpetuity, you've basically said it is okay to commit a crime, the government will then make peace with you when you are tired, of committing the crime, and then you can come and all will be well. And if you communicate that to a citizenry, you're not trying to solve a problem. You're just trying to create an ecosystem for a problem to exist in cycles. So some people commit the offense, then they come into amnesty, another group commits the offense, and they continue in amnesty. So in the transition of we had an issue, we had a crisis, what do we do with these people? How do we enable them to earn a living legally? by developing skills and all of that. But as with a lot of things that we do with our human capital in Nigeria, it's just not well taught. It's not well thought out. And it's the same at secondary school level, at primary school level. That, I mean, you had universities shut down for eight, eight months. So I think it's, while the program has its merits, it, the devil is in the detail. And unfortunately, when you have programs like that, that, that has an office and an infrastructure, when you want to shut it down, all the people that are the secretary, the head, the DG, and the people that make it run are jobless. 
So we, the design ab initio should factor in people who don't want to stay there forever. So you have a two-year tenure. This is what we're trying to achieve. This is what we're going to do. We're not building a local a, a office in every state in the South-South. Now we're going to build an office in every state in the Northwest if we want to do banditry, because that's how we deal with government projects. Everybody wants their own share, even every local government, if it's possible. So yeah, I think it's just a reflection of our, our attitude towards human capital and the fact that we don't think about it holistically. It's job for the boys in keeping people engaged and, and uh, yeah, just... Uh, Professor Akintero. Uh, for this, a number of times here that the government of Nigeria under President Muhammad Buhari thinks after action. <laughs> Every time. So, if the stakeholders reportedly now made a case convincing enough to warrant a change of policy decision, why didn't the government Consult them before, before saying you, you, you are going to end the program. Why? There is the need to always sit down, engage in critical thinking. It's always like that. Second point, I think the government, even though the genesis has been traced to 2009, rightly, but you discover that under President Muhammad Buhari, I don't know the friend uh, Professor Ura was referring to. He's also but your I, friend, you know him too. Now, <laughs> now, now, you see. But you don't want to name him. No, 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 no. Your, your okay. friend. It remains nameless. Same prof, your, your friend. Your friend. <laughs> Our friend. Is your friend too. Was accused. Our friend. <laughs> was probed. All right? And said 12 billion naira was missing. Suspended. But you see, the beauty of um, the suspension was that he came back and was asked to go. All right? And now a letter was given to him commending him for having performed well. It was published in the papers. You suspended somebody, and again you, you, you sent him packing. Yet you are giving a letter saying he has done well. I can't understand this type of logic, type of administration. This is the issue. Hmm. So this is your friend. <laughs> At the end of the day, you, you are advising. No, you see, that's why Nigeria cannot easily make it. Yeah. You know that this thing is fundamentally wrong, yet you are commending that. Somebody steals money in Nigeria, the next thing you give chief tenancy title. Full page ad. Ah, I can't understand that. And everybody else yes, will be advertising, commending you all along. When will Nigeria people stop enough praising enough. societal ills? That is the issue. She says enough is enough. <laughs> <laughs> enough is enough. That's the issue. Anyway, let's take just one more subject and then we'll call it a day on today's episode of the program. The Central Bank of Nigeria says its new policy that significantly limits the amount of money individuals and organizations can withdraw from banks. We proceed amidst calls for the move to be reversed. The bank's governor, Godwin Emefile, told journalists after a meeting with President Muhammad Buhari on Thursday that the bank was willing to change the sums, but that the policy would still be followed. He remarked after the House of Representatives called on Mr. Emefile and requested a change in the policy. Well, there you have it. But what the central bank uh, governor also said is that the central bank will not be rigid in terms of the implementation. Two, the central bank of Nigeria also has the support of the uh, federal government, of the uh, president even uh, personally, and that had been established. But the National Assembly is asking for explanations, more information, for a review. And we've been told that the CBN governor and his team have been invited uh, to come forward on Tuesday. Uh, this Thursday or Tuesday, the coming week, okay, uh, to come and explain. And I was uh, again elsewhere on this same station that perhaps that interaction should have even 
occurred okay. before, before the announcement of the <laughs> policy, not <laughs> after, not after. Uh, the fact. He says they think after action. That's <laughs> what know, he said earlier. Because it looks like you know the National Assembly <laughs> has been presented with a fair complaint. However, the CBN is very clear that, look, the policy has brought in over one trillion uh, that is outside the uh, bank vaults and that is yielding uh, positive uh, results. But uh, I hope uh, those of you who have, uh, you know, bags of, uh, you know, 200 naira <laughs> notes, 500 naira notes, 1,000 naira notes, have taken them, you know, into the uh, uh, bank vaults. But uh, Yemi Adamolok, I don't know, uh, you are an activist. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh Nigeria's cashless policy is not new. I forget what year, what year was it initially? 2012. 2012. Okay, so yeah. we're in it. A Ten decade. years ago. Thank you. So it's a decade. So we're making it seem as if, I mean, the scroll, that's it, no going back on cashless policy. We're making it seem as if, or maybe it may feel like it's making it seem as if this is a not where, the fact that this is, we're trying to build a cashless environment is a novel thing. But it's not. And maybe the questions then to think about is why is there a challenge? We have a lot of network issues. We have a lot of people who don't trust in the banking system. Uh, this policy supposedly would affect a, a lot of the network agents that they now have small amounts of money, commissions that people have to pay to get money out from POS agents. It's also money being spent. I mean, so my real question in this is if you're not going to be rigid, then what, where does that leave the policy? Because if you're not going to be rigid, that means it's flexible in the amount. But you've set amounts. So why set amounts if you don't plan to enforce those amounts? I don't understand it. Maybe I missed it. No, I thought what the CBN governor said is that it could be reviewed. Precisely. Yeah, okay. it could be reviewed somewhere down the line. For, for now, now, it's we'll 100,000 per week for individuals, individuals 500,000 naira for corporate organizations. But if you exceed it, then you pay. You You'll pay. be surcharged. You know, accordingly, 5%, 10%. You might be in such a professor. He has not received any salary. Not even that. Um, I don't have a lot of money. Uh, people, when they see a professor, they think uh, he has uh, bags of money somewhere. But that is, uh, by the way, um, my take is that uh, the cashless policy is a good policy. Uh, I mean, that's what everybody is doing across the world. And uh, like we have established since 2010, 10 years in the making. Um, but I do not think that that threshold is good enough. Um, 100,000 per week, 500,000 for corporate body is too small. So uh, in the comment that it's not rigid, there needs to be a review. They should review the thing up. Uh, I've been in rural areas where I would have been in trouble if I didn't have cash. Um, I've also been even to supermarkets in Abuja and Lagos, yep. Yep. where I met friends who it's were stopped because their cards weren't working. I had to bail out yeah. Yeah. because I had cash, they didn't have cash. Yeah. I always have an alternative because I know that our system is not you know, as reliable as one would want. So whereas we, the cash policy is good, we should pursue it, but I would suggest that we make haste slowly. Yeah. That amount, that treasury, it will also affect so many traders and all. We can't sit in Lagos, Abuja, and Botakot, and Ibado and assume that we know what is happening in the rurals except you're a grassroots person. We go to the grassroots and we know what happens there. So in the not being rigid that the uh, CBN governor announced, there should be a review such that the 100,000 be something higher, the 500,000 be something higher, so that traders who need cash to go about their business every day and all that, it will not because we want to do cash flow policy and then push them out of into poverty. Mm. Uh, that is what I think ought, uh, needs to be done. Well, Why we still continue to pursue the cash flow policy? Nigeria is not going to end tomorrow or the day after. There will still be CBN governors after MFLA. So it's something that we should pursue, but we should make haste slowly. Professor Akintero. The rural women, the market women, they are not the problem per se in the eyes of MFLA or the government. Left to me, I, I like the amount given. Even if it is not as much, it is still better. You know, the cardinal objective of MFLA from deductive um, um, analysis, those who have been keeping money, the money that snakes will swallow and will not be able to find, those corrupt people keeping money, you see, houses, they now brought money, you touch it, it's already spoiled there. They now want to prevent them 
from taking advantage of quote and unquote ill gotten money. Because they are now, if you can only withdraw eh, 100,000 per day for five days, per week, per week eh, five working days, not for seven days, only for five, and then 500,000 per day for corporate. Um, not per day, per week. 100,000 per week. And that's why you said five week. working days. That's, 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 yeah. that's yeah. why I say five working days. Now, you see, the issue there is that if you are allowed more money, then you have the opportunity to change your ill-gotten money. Okay. I'm not unaware of the fact that people, market women who can suffer, who will suffer all along, I have sympathy for them too. But it is better to fight corruption frontally. So you agree with the limits as it is? Yes. Oh, interesting. No, no, yes. Let us seize this opportunity. If Buhari is sincere, if Emefele is also sincere, let us see them fight this corruption. Let them identify people having this money. I don't have any money to withdraw. You can transfer. <laughs> okay? You can transfer. Yes, now, look, I've left office. Let you me need, tell you. Need I, a, I, you need a I, bank account to I can tell you that my lawyer has just written to NI saying that they owe me money, money that I spent. They have not paid me my money. <laughs> and they're waiting. <laughs> so I don't have money to withdraw. <laughs> to withdraw. <laughs> So those who have money Rough, to you are carrying placard on this day life. <laughs> no, 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 but it's that, a statement of fact. That, that is true, statement of fact. If anybody. <laughs> All right? The the DG and I will be served any minute from now because they asked me to wait. <laughs> so why should some people have money stuck in their way, in their houses? And you now want to now take advantage to quickly be changing them all along. I think um, you know our language here. This idea of uh, your head is correct. When, when I listen to this same thing in other, other platforms to say, look, they have borrowed from uh, this day live uh, platform. Please, this time, let us collectively fight for a better Nigeria that will be completely okay. free. Which is precisely Godwin and Mayfield's point. Yes, he said that this policy is not targeted at anybody, hmm. uh, contrary to your point about you know, uh, the CBN is going after some people. He says, this is not targeted at anybody. It is meant for the good and the development of the Nigerian uh, economy. The, the target is a corrupt people. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, yes, uh, Professor Akintera. Thank you, Professor Aurawa. And thank you, Yemi You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now. And thank you very much for watching.